Amen, and thank you, Patty. So as we begin to look at what breakthrough prayer is, I'm going to look at different concepts of prayer each week, different tools of praying, and then we're going to discuss those a little further on Wednesday night. You don't need to have all the answers. We're going to learn from each other. We're going to discuss that a little further on Wednesday nights in the fireside room, as I invite you, encourage you to be a part of that too. The first thing we're going to look at is the attitude of prayer. The reason I picked Samson so many months ago as I was planning out a sermon retreat and this whole thing was getting planned out is because Samson spent his whole life on earth with the wrong attitude of prayer. Samson was one of these men, you could name him a wonderful guy, gifted athletically. He would have been a fine athlete. He was a soldier and he did very well for Israel. They were becoming a nation. They, they did not have a king yet. But they were becoming a powerhouse as they settled in the promised land and they had judges, high priests that kind of ran their movement, <coughs> excuse me, in their development as a nation. And as that nation developed, Samson became one of their great known soldiers, their strongest one, especially against their neighboring enemy, the Philistines, and their capital, Dagon. So let's pray as we begin to look at an attitude of prayer. Gracious Lord, I, I thank you for so much richness in your testaments, your Old and your New Testaments. Those who took time to make sure that these true stories come alive, they speak to us. Samson is one of those stories of what it means to be caught in lust and never understand love. But in the end, he got it. And he got it in time. Help us today learn from Samson's life. Holy Spirit, open us up to ask the honesty of what is my attitude of prayer. We don't have to tell anybody else. We just talk to you about it. Not out of guilt, but out of grace and love. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. Help us hear you. And so, Lord, I ask always, as we look at Samson. May the words of my mouth, Holy Spirit, may they not be mine, but yours. And with gratitude, but expectation, Lord, but humbly, may the words come alive. And may we hear you, because the distractions are on the shelf. May we hear you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And so as we look at what breakthrough prayer, as in different concepts, so that we're going to look at attitude. In attitude of prayer is really important because often we go through different attitudes as we approach prayer. I mean, there is times where I'm honest. My attitude is I need healing, Lord. I need healing. I think of Jaron. I think of uh, uh, Berkeley, Damhoff, and battling cancer. I think of those people that had to face the harsh reality of dropping their children off in a, in a, a school system, a, a middle school system, in a high school and, and saying goodbye and, and not thinking anything else. And then coming to the horrifying act of that day that they're going to bury their child or some of the staff members. I don't understand that. And when I get into those moments, all I'm praying for is healing. And I get it that God expects us to do that and, and God wants us to do that. And that's okay. But often... Do we come to prayer with an attitude of gratitude, with an attitude of thankfulness, with an attitude of, Lord, before I get to what I want, genuinely, help me be grateful because you are God. I don't know about you, but I go through different seasons of maturity in prayer. I can remember when I was first a, a Christian, I was in high school, and I was on my bicycle, and, and, and I was a new Christian, and... And, and I had come home from camp just kind of born again, soaking up God's love. And, and I, I literally did this. I, I'm not making this up. I, I, I sat up and took the hands off of my um, bike bar. It was like a 10-speed bike. And, and started folding them. And I thought, well, God, if I'm praying, I, I know this sounds crazy immature. <laughs> but uh, if I'm praying, God's going to keep me from hitting a car or something. Don't do this. I'm recommending you never to do this because it didn't end well. 
Okay? Don't ever do this, children. And I mean this. So I, I sat up and I closed my eyes and I'm biking down this street. Bam! Right into a car. And I, and I, I looked at God. What happened? And I, it's almost as I'm not making this up because I was 17 years old. I, God said to me, you don't have to close your eyes to pray. You can just focus on the road and, and be okay. We think that there's only one way to pray. We think we have to hold our hands and we, we have to say the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is good. I'm not knocking it. But God listens to us no matter what. God wants us to just come with it and, and he longs for this because of free will. An attitude of prayer and gratitude. Just, just, Lord, there is no other God that matches you. That's why I believe in you. It's not putting other religions down. And I'm not going there. It's just saying, I love you, and I'm choosing you. I'm not choosing some other way. That's the attitude that God is looking for. I, I think of this whole thing, we call it, we've kind of coined it over the last number about 10 or 15 years, prosperity gospel. <clears throat> where where we, we think that if we do everything right and we do all the morals that God asks us to do, God's going to bless us better than everybody else. The problem with prosperity gospel, it's a self-centered life. It's like saying, I'm going to follow God the way God wants me to, which we should do anyway out of just sheer respect and love for God. It shouldn't even be a question. But I'm going to do it so I can get something back. Some of you have heard this, this story before of me. When I was younger, I lost my car keys, or my truck keys actually, it was to a small truck I had while I was in college, and I was in a hurry, and I needed to get to work. Of course, I didn't plan for losing my keys that morning, and I looked everywhere. I'm serious. I, I looked in the couch. You heard this story, maybe, and, and I finally said, I gotta pray. I just, I have to pray. And I looked up, and I said, God, I'm in trouble here. I, I need to find my keys. Just please. And I looked, and boom! I must have looked on that nightside stand a hundred times. Well, that's an exaggeration, but at least two or three times. They weren't there, and all of a sudden, boom, they're there. And I was so amazed, so amazed at my immaturity of prosperity gospel. Wow! Wow! That was good! Wow! Can I have a red soft top Jeep? I've always wanted one of those. That's not how God wants us to pray. That's immature prayer. By the way, I didn't get a red soft top. I walked outside and my Azusa pickup was still out there. The attitude of prayer is really what I'm getting at. And I'm asking us just to think about what that attitude of prayer is. As we, and, and it's not to guilt us. It's just to think about where we're at. What season in life am I at? Where am I at in my season of life with my attitude of prayer? And it's all about what's going on in our lives. If some of you, it's always about our children. I constantly pray for my son as I don't know what he's doing each day or what's going on. And, and for some of us, it's something else. For some of us, it's a disease or something we're battling. It might be a marriage we're working through. It might be something at a job. But how do we approach God with that attitude as we come to God in prayer? We're going to learn some of the ugliness of that through our friend Samson. Samson was a man who was gifted. He was born... And the Israelite nation, as they were coming of a nation, he was born as a true Israelite, and he had everything. He's, he's one of those guys that was kind of the real deal when you're growing up. He had all the strength, and, and he had all the natural ability. He even had a, a good intellect, somewhat. The problem is, Samson never developed, he never matured in his years of puberty or adolescence, he never matured what, what men get, this, this crave for lust instead of love, and he never matured out of that. He spent his whole life confused that lust was love. And it shows that if you read the book of Judges and read his story. He was always in that, in that army of Israelite, he was conquering the Philistines, and he was the leader of their military when it came to might and power. He was, in, he was a tool that they had a machine, a person that they had that was good for them and kept the Philistines from disrupting God's plan. But he liked women. And he liked stuff. 
And he would take Philistine stuff. He would take Philistine women. And he would abuse them in the name of lust. And, and eventually ended up with a Philistine lady uh, after several uh, relationships gone bad. You can read that in the book of Judges. He ended up with a Philistine lady named Delilah. And Delilah never loved him. But Samson was, was not mature enough to recognize that. And the Philistine said, hey, we want you to... To, to really, really get involved with Samson because he doesn't understand real love anyway. We want you to marry him and we want you to find out the secret of his strength because there's something with that man that we can have and we can conquer Israel. So Delilah, just play along with it. And Samson fell for the oldest trick in the book that we all know about. He fell for looks over real love. And after they got married, uh, Samson thought he was in love. He was really in lust. And he began to have this relationship with Delilah. And Delilah would always tell him, uh, give me your secret to your strength. And, and Samson at first, after three attempts, he thought, oh, Delilah, she wants this for the Philistines. She doesn't want this for true love. And he would make up some story. And then he would break out of the prison that they'd put him in. And he would get back to his full strength. And then finally... Delilah says to Samson, I really, really, really love you. Please tell me your truth. I won't tell anybody. You've got to understand that Delilah has already lied three times and Samson knows it. You know, he's not very bright in the head, okay? When it comes to women, Samson didn't have a clue. And I'm not putting down women. I'm just saying how far lust got Samson. And finally, he trusts Delilah. He falls for this. Because he doesn't understand his attitude of love is lust or self-centeredness. And he tells Delilah, and, and I'm not going to get into all this, but he tells Delilah the, the secret of his strength because Israelite uh, men were supposed to take care of their hair. Now, no pun intended as I look outside here, okay? <laughs> but they were supposed to take care of their hair. And, and that was very important to them. And... Finally, Samson says, well, the secret is if you shave my head, I will lose my strength. So they shaved his head when he fell asleep. They lost his strength, and the Philistines literally took him and bound him and uh, took his eyesight from him. That's a way that you can read in the book of Judges. And put him in prison, and all of a sudden, Israel lost their main strength. And they're in a lot of trouble. And Samson knows it. He's in prison in the temple of the Philistine nation called Dagon, which was... Filled with false gods. Made up gods. That's the last thing God likes when we start worshiping false gods. And, and Samson had been doing that for many years. And you and I are asked, what is my attitude of prayer? Do we come to God and say, God, I, I need this? And we treat God like a Santa Claus? I really need you to fix this in my life? I, I can never get over... <clears throat> The way that people pray sometimes. I really mean this. I, I had a friend in grad school. This guy was notorious for running out of gas. He would never stop at a gas station. I'm not making this up. And every time we got in his car, we always scared the tank was going to be on a quarter to empty or on the whatever the reserve tank is. And I was so upset with him. I remember one time we were driving to a concert, a Christian concert. And he says, great, we just got to pray, candles, we just got to pray that God will get us there with the, the, with the gas we have, because I'm out of gas. And I just looked at him and said, did you ever think that God invented gas stations so this would not happen? <laughs> well, yeah, but we got to have faith. Well, put the faith in a gas station, okay, Tom? It's time to do that. I mean, or, or you have people, and if you're one of these, don't raise your hand, now's not a good time to admit you're one of these that are perpetually late to everything. Y'all have friends that are, are late. In other words, you know who they are. I can see you looking. Don't look at your spouse and say him, but I can see you looking. And you know that when you tell this person to be somewhere, you tell them a half an hour ahead of time because they ain't gonna make it otherwise. They're gonna be late to their own funeral. And I look at some of the, I have a friend, literally, I'm convinced he's going to be late to his own funeral. I get that. I looked at him one time and I said, did you ever think that God made cell phones with clocks or day planners or stuff like that so you could like change your life? 
How do we approach God with prayer? Do we understand the God that we're coming to? And the attitude that we bring to prayer. Samson has had a reawakening. He is in a temple in a city Dagon with false gods. And he understands that he has spent his whole life in lust. And now he loves God. And he knows that his life is going to end. He's going to die. But you know what they would do? The Philistines would break Samson out and chain him up in the temple as one of their captors. And they would celebrate that they captured Samson with no eyes. And, and they would just kind of abuse that image as a way to, to say our false gods are better than the Israelite true God. And they bring Samson out and he comes out for one of these parties. They have him chained up. And he knows his life is going to end. But his attitude, his life is going to end on earth. But his attitude of prayer changes completely. Look at the change of attitude. Then Samson, he's in the temple in Dagon. And then Samson called to the Lord and said, as he's chained up as one of their prized possessions, Lord God, remember me and strengthen me only this once. In other words, I know that my life is over on this side of life. But I believe there's a heaven. And I believe that you are real. And I believe that there is real love. And because of that, God, so that with this one act of revenge against Dagon, against the Philistines, against the false gods of this temple, may I pay back the Philistines for my two eyes. And if I don't, God, if it doesn't happen and I die anyway, I love you. And I really love you. That doesn't change. This is not a deal breaker. This is not you give me this, I give you that. I love you. And then if you read verse 29, you understand how much he believed. Because after that prayer, in verse 29, as Patty read, he puts his hands on each pillar in the temple as if he believes God's going to answer him. Did you hear me? That's the attitude of prayer. I've said this before, I'll say it again. I think of that prayer service they had in western Kansas because they didn't have any rain and finally the pastor said we got to pray <coughs> and they got all the people together as an ecumenical prayer service one Sunday night and the pastor was going to lead them in prayer because they were desperate it was tough times in western Kansas and they needed rain the pastor gets up there's over a thousand people there's 2,500 people in the town he gets up he looks at everybody and says you can all go home they're mad they're, they're, they're steaming they're like we came here to pray pastor well then some of you better go home and bring an umbrella if you're going to pray for rain. The attitude of prayer. Samson knows that God's going to deliver because he's coming with an attitude of gratitude. He's coming with an attitude of no matter what happens, Lord, I'm with you. You got this whether I live or die, I am with you. Whether the, the, the temple comes down crushing because of my strength regained through you or not, I am with you. What is my attitude of prayer? And so Samson prays with an attitude of dependence on God, not on lust, not on women, not on his strength, but a dependence on God. Folks, I don't know if you're suffering through it right now or if you have been through cancer or disease. I have been with enough people where I admire them because you know what their attitude of prayer is in the midst of cancer? Whether I live or die, I'm still God's. Whether I come out of this the way I want to or not, I am not losing my relationship with God. Uh, people that pray through a, a death that came prematurely, I'm still God's. I'm not giving up on God. Because God is my refuge and my strength in the middle of the storm. And Samson has finally reached that point in life. And so he begins to pray that prayer, as I said. And here's the attitude of prayer. Verse 30. Let me die with the Philistines. I know it's over, Lord. On earth it's over. But I'd rather die with my life entrusted in you and your grace than in this Dagon temple with all of the false gods and believing in that. And just to prove that I believe you, Lord. Verse 30. He strained with all his might. If it didn't go down, he still would have believed. And the house fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. 
And so those he killed at his death were more than those he killed during his life. This isn't about revenge or getting even. Don't misread this. It's about an attitude of prayer. You know, the interesting thing about this is, if you were to read this chapter in Judges, and I encourage you to do that, chapter 16, actually chapter 14, 15, the whole story. Um, Delilah said over and over, tell me your secret. And finally, Samson said, it's my hair. If you cut my hair, I lose my strength. And that night, they cut his hair and he lost his strength. And chapter 16, verse 22, you know what it says? Now, he's not back to God with an attitude of gratitude, but he's, he's starting to learn. <clears throat> Even though he wasn't with an attitude of gratitude, in chapter 16, verse 22, it says his hair began to grow back. Okay, you're thinking, what is the point, Pastor Bob? God's grace is working in our lives even before our attitude is the correct attitude. In chapter 16, verse 22, Samson cared less about whether or not he was right with God. His hair was cut and he wanted it back. What did God do? I love you no matter who you are or what your attitude is, Samson, and where you're at in life, and your hair will grow back. Now, don't misread that if some of you are out there. and I can't do Don't worry about that, Okay. <laughs> But do you see the grace that's happening in Samson's life? I think of my friends who are in recovery, and they talk to me, and they, their eyes become clearer once they become full recovered people, and they see God's grace was working even when I was messed up, in spite of it. An attitude of gratitude. And so you and I are invited to the altar today. I'm going to have David play a song in a bit. It's an older song from the, from the late 80s. It's called The Touch of the Master's Hand. It's about, a, it's about a, an auctioneer who had a violin that was dusty and gray and out of tune. It could barely play. And he held the violin up at, you know what, you've been to an auction. And he says, who will give me at least $1 or $2 or 3 And nobody would bid. And they started leaving the room. And, and they thought, who'd want an old, dusty, gray violin out of tune? And, and then a guy from the back in the song, as it tells the story, comes up, he dusts the violin off, he tunes it up really good, and he plays out a melody, godly, and, and full of an attitude of, of just, God, you are God, of gratitude. And he plays this melody off. People start coming back into the room, and they start looking at this violin with a whole new light. And then the auctioneer grabs and amazed after he played that. And he holds up the violin and, and the bowstring. And he says, who will give me 1000 2000 3 Now that's a fair price. And people are bidding and bidding and bidding. And finally someone said, what made the difference? And the auctioneer smiled and he said, it was the touch of the master's hand. That song is going to unfold in just a bit. And I'm going to ask him. Um, I believe either Peyton or Terry to come up and we're going to pass out these, um, these wristbands.